grab your Bible, turn to uh, Mark chapter 12, and we're going to get there in just a moment. I say that I'm going to set this up a bit, but we're talking about how Jesus actually draws from the Old Testament, from the scriptures of the Old Testament that point to himself. We're going to look at that today. And what's cool today, it's going to lean us in. I really feel it. Lean us into Easter. We're going to find Jesus in the last week of his, of his life. He's in Jerusalem, and we're going to look at that. Before we dive in, I'm going to set your hearts on what I want to, where I want to head today. I wonder how many of y'all, kids or otherwise, maybe like me growing up, it's been around for a while. How many of y'all watch, anybody ever watched uh, Scooby-Doo? Anybody a Scooby-Doo? Big Scooby-Doo fan. Okay, whether you're old, young, Scooby is like awesome. The team, what's cool about the cartoon is there's always this uh, mystery, right? Then the mystery machine. And at the end of the show, each episode, um, there's the big villain reveal. And they pull off the mask and it's like, oh my gosh, it's the elderly heiress, you know, or it's the kind, but a little creepy gardener. Oh my gosh. he's the one. And then Velma steps up and she's explaining the motive as to why it all happened a bit sanctimoniously. And she's telling everybody what went down and kind of, I'm over it, but she kind of bugs me, but, yeah, um, but she's telling what's, you know, and they, they all figured out what went down and it was, oh my gosh. And it kind of surprises you. Right. And that's the whole thing. And Scooby, roo, 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 you know, he doesn't know what's happening. And then there it is. Sometimes he reveals what's going on, but what happens, what's crazy in real life is when the villain is revealed so often in our own personal lives, in our own spiritual lives, and in, in the very thing that we want God to do in us, when the mask is pulled off, it's us. It's me. I become my own worst villain, sabotaging the, uh, the very work that God wants to do in my life. And so what we see is Jesus uh, was constantly coming after, unmasking, right, the villains of his day. And as we'll see today, often, if you know scriptures, you're going, nah, I know who that is. I know who the villains were. But instead of kind of throwing rocks at others today, really hard thing to do. I'm asking us to come humbly before him and say, Lord, you show me, reveal to me, pull off the mask of my life. Let me see how I am sabotaging what you're seeking to do in my life, right? I mean, it's the addict who will not, who refuses to be accountable to other people. And all of us addicted to sin in some form or fashion, I will not share what's going on in my life. We're only as sick as our secrets, we often say around here. I mean, it's the well-meaning parent who's actually hindering the growth of their child by rescuing them every time they're in trouble, kind of stunning their own social or spiritual maturity. It's the, um, it's the spouse who, who will not humble themselves and say, what is it like to be married to me? Maybe I'm the problem, right? And so what I want us to do is just, Lord, break down the walls in my life, the things I cannot see. So how can we become more self-aware? How can we actually see the blind spots in, in our lives when we all have them and they're blind spots because we can't see them? So I'm aware of the great challenge that I have here today, but I'm trusting the Spirit that you're saying yes to Him as we're going to see the solution is to see that Jesus is the cornerstone. That's where all this is heading. Okay, so to frame Mark chapter 12, where you are now, um, you've got to look back. We're going to see a parable, actually. And every time Jesus shows uh, or tells a parable, you've got to see who's he, who's he talking about. Now, clearly, he's talking to us. But if you look back in Mark chapter 11, you have the scripture there open, you'll see that the scribes, the, 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 um, the, the elders, the Pharisees, they are among that group, the Sadducees. They're this group of religious leaders that are challenging Jesus. And, and he's saying, hey, they're, they're asking, where does, your, uh, where does your authority come from? And, and now catch this. He's already now into that final week of his life. So already the, the triumphal entry has happened. Okay, Palm Sunday, he's entered to, into Jerusalem the last time. Keep that in mind. This will come back to play. And then we've seen him, he's gone into the temple. How about this? He cursed the fig tree. He goes in the temple, looks around, and he actually then uh, turns over the tables. Like, you guys have missed it all together. He's causing quite a stir. Goes back, the fig tree has withered up. Now these guys are coming after him. It's probably Tuesday-ish, Wednesday maybe, Palm Sunday. All of this has happened. I mean, there's quite a stir in Jerusalem during the Passover. And so now Jesus is being challenged as he was often by the religious leaders. 
They come to say, hey, where's your authority come from? And he answers the question with a question. You know how he does this so often? In fact, check this out. Jesus is asked 300, and no, he asked 307 questions throughout his ministry. And, and no, he asked 100, I think he's asked 307. And so what happens is, and check this out, he's asked 307 times and he answers, how many, how many out of 307 you think he answers? This is for real. He answers three questions. So for every, every question he's asked, he literally asks or answers one out of 100. One out of 100. Now, there's something to be learned there before we get to the text. A lot of us think, I've got to have all the answers. I've got to, you know, if I can't enter into spiritual conversations because I don't know if, you know, they're going to ask me something I don't know. And, and, and here's the deal. No, no, no. Je contrary to popular belief, Jesus was not the answer man. He is that. He's the answer. He was the great questioner. He was always asking questions. And we can do that as well. You know, this is, I, I think, in terms of apologetics or sharing the gospel in this new, now, a cultural moment we find ourselves in, I think the best way to share the gospel is not, let me give you the answers. Here's the answer. Let me tell you what's up. I know what's up. And let me tell you where you're wrong. Let, that's where a lot of us go. That's not evangelism, frankly. There's a time to correct and such. But even better, to ask questions. And as we enter into this Easter season, just be mindful of that. Just learn out of great love, ask questions because you're extending grace and you're also learning about where they are. And I've learned that people who really don't know the gospel don't have hope, right? And they're going to ultimately back themselves into a corner and you say, hey, wow, I've been there too. And let me tell you what the truth is. So this is a great, it's called the rabbinic method of teaching. In fact, he asks questions and we see it here. So he answers a question with a question, but really the answer to their question, where does your authority come from, is going to, to be kind of hidden in the parable that he's about to tell. Because he says to them, see, here's the thing. If he, if, if he says, well, you tell me, where did John the Baptist's authority come from? That's what he's saying in chapter 11 before he's setting up this parable. And, and they say, um, they won't answer him. Okay, because if they say uh, from heaven, then he's aligned with John. So they're saying his authority is from heaven. If they say uh, not from God, not from heaven, then, then uh, the, the crowd, they're scared of the crowd, okay? Because there's quite a buzz around Jesus right now. And so he says, okay, if you're not going to answer my question, um, I'm going to ask you a question, you know, and, and that kind of thing. And then he says, uh, in fact, no, let me tell you a story. And that's where we find ourselves in, in, in Mark chapter 12. Let's look at it together. Mark chapter 12, beginning verse 1. And he began to speak to them in parables, okay, and this is the only one, only major parable out of, out of, uh, in Mark, out of chapter four. The other gospels have this story as well. He says this, a man planted a vineyard and put a fence around it and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and leased it to tenants and went into another country. Okay, pause. I'm going to kind of exegete this along the way as we go, just briefly. So there's the vineyard owner, okay? He's got tenants who are coming. He's leasing this land out. This is very common. And so he leases it out. Notice there's a wine press and a tower. There's a fence around it. The fence is there to protect others from coming in, you know, stealing grapes or whatever else, or animals to come in. And so there's a fence and there's a tower for protection. But he also has a wine press. This is like, this is a business. I mean, this is a manufacturing kind of wine, winery, if you will. And, and he leases it to the tenants and then he goes off to another country. Okay. When the season came, that would be harvest, he sent a servant to the tenants. He sent one of his servants to get, get from them some, check that out, some of the fruit of the vineyard, and they took him and beat him and sent him away empty-handed. Then in verse 4, again, he sent to them another servant, and they struck him on the head, watch the progression, and treated him shamefully. And he sent another, and him they killed, and so with many others. Some they beat and some they killed. Now, here's, here's the thing. Here's what you got to understand. It's real clear. Uh, the reference to, to the vineyard is, are the people of Israel. We see this throughout the Old Testament. The people of God are the, are the vineyard, and he's sending, any guesses? He's sending prophets throughout the years, throughout the, the centuries. He's sending voices to turn them to God, the one who owns the vineyard. And instead of, of hearing them, turning to him, honoring the owner, okay, 
They're acting like they're owners and not stewards of this message that God's given them. And, and they, instead, they kill the prophets, they send them away, and then watch this, verse 6. It gets real, real clear. He had still one other, a beloved son. Finally, he sent him to them, saying, They will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. And they took him and killed him and threw him out of the vineyard. Matthew's telling of the story. He says they, they took him, they killed him, and, and sent him out of the city. Just as Jesus here, not too many days from now, will be placed out of the city. He'll be crucified on a cross and buried. And Jesus tells this story to point out to them that he is the one that you are now rejecting. And so I want you to look at this with me. There's three things I want you to see in this story today that we can apply to our lives, all right? We're going to see that their entitlement is what it was, led them to a blindness, a spiritual blindness. Spiritual blindness leads to an ongoing stubbornness that can create within us a hardened heart. And all of us are more susceptible to this than we can even realize. But their refusal to answer his questions leads them to, to uh, leads him to tell this story. He's speaking to power here. Okay, he's speaking to a privileged people who are in power. And let's see why the religious leaders were actually the villains, and how we too can do the same. So first, I want you to see entitlement leads to rejection. All right, they had this sense of entitlement. Entitlement is the belief that I deserve something, right? I'm in a privileged position. I have benefits. Now, living in America, we have certain benefits and privileges. We, we are entitled to certain rights. There's entitlement that we have as citizens. We have this religious freedom. We have you know, freedom of, of religion. We have freedom of speech, those kinds of things. So there's certain entitlements that are good things in a culture. But there's an entitlement, a personal entitlement that we can enter into that not only uh, makes us the villains in our own story, but it also has societal and systemic challenges. Uh, Dr. John Townsend, maybe you've heard of him, he wrote a book uh, that's called The Entitlement Cure. And uh, in it, he calls entitlement an attitudinal, an, an attitudinal disease that is pandemic in our culture. And what I want us to see, this is the hard part. How is it that I live and act as if I'm entitled? Because entitlement will lead you to a joyless life, a life of ingratitude, a life of comparison. And you will constantly be wanting and seeking more. You're going to be angry with other people. You're going to feel that you have preferential treatment. When people don't serve you well, watch this. If you go out to lunch today or if somebody's serving you this week, how do you respond to people? Or, or when somebody does you wrong, you become especially vindictive because that should never happen to me. And we stand up you know, for our rights because we're entitled. Entitlement can be deadly in our personal relationships, but it can be, can be deadly in society as well. This past week, some of you saw what took place in Christ Church, New Zealand. Now, Stacy and I have been to this beautiful, peaceful city. It's an amazing place. But uh, this Australian went into two different mosques and shot up, killed 49 people while they were worshiping. He wrote this 74-page manifesto. Did anybody read about this? You see this? It's, it, they, they're saying now this is moved to next level. He's on Facebook Live doing this, killing 49 people. And what sociologists have said, criminologists who study this kind of thing, he matches the profile that we see over and over again. And it's called the triple, triple entitlement. He's white, he's heterosexual male, and he is what he thinks in his mind. He's on this downward mobility. And he's blaming everybody else for it. Because he's white, because he's male, he's in a place of privilege. And I'm entitled. And these other people, namely immigrants, people of color, minorities, are taking away my privilege. And he goes out and he shoots up 
and kills people. We've seen it over and over again. The massacre of the nine in Charleston, we've seen it across our nation. And it's simply, now some of you are saying, man, that's jacked up. That's messed up. I'm not, I'm not going to kill any. Watch this. Let me ask you, how is it that you, in your place of privilege, and if you're living in North Dallas, frankly, you are a person of privilege. And can I say it? If, we're, if you're white like me, male, I ha- I've had to step back and say, wow, how is it that I enter into this kind of triple entitlement myself? Because, friends, we are to denounce this kind of violence against any group any faith group or any people on the planet because all people are created in the image of God. In any place there's persecution, religious persecution, in any place on the globe, it impacts the rest of us. We've got to stand together. So I reached out to an imam friend of mine here in Dallas, Omar Suleiman, reached out to him this week and said, man, I'm so sorry because of the empathy in my heart that he's feeling it among his people. He's speaking into this. But we've got to stand up and and come against this kind of stuff. I want you to notice that the tower and the fence are there to protect the vineyard, I've noted, from outside threats. But the threat comes from within. From within. The threat comes inside. Entitlement happens in your own life. And you become your worst villain. Entitlement takes place in your home when you struggle in your marriage to think, my spouse owes me. For years, Stacy and I, when, when the kids were younger in particular, we still have talked about this, but we can enter into, when the kids were young, we often entered into this uh, who had the worst day game. You ever done this? You get home and, whew, man, my day was, wow. I mean, it was rough. It was really tough. I got to tell you about this. And, you know, at the time, Stacy was, was raising her kids at home, and it was more like, hey, welcome uh, home from your eight-hour vacation, big boy. Here, <laughs> have a baby, Okay. Um, get over yourself, right? And so it's always, you know, well, my day was hard. How about you? No, and you're trying to outdo each other. Entitlement. I've been working hard. You just, let me kick my feet up. You got to take care of me. And, and we, we enter into this. It happens when a, an uprising of our kids, when they feel entitled to things that we have as parents. And we, you, I deserve this. Uh, listen, kids don't deserve anything from their parents. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, okay, love and awe, I get it, all that. But no, kids don't, they haven't done anything to, to deserve something. They're a financial liability, in fact, right? <laughs> they haven't done nothing. Entitlement takes place in the workplace when we think everybody's here for me. I mean, if they get their act together, if that person... And so, so what happens is, in the, it can happen in the family of God. And so for, look at this, in Isaiah 5, 7, just to make a point, I could have gone to a lot of places. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. I mean, it's us. And the men of Judah are his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, found bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. The very people who are supposed to uphold equity and justice and be witnesses of God's love in the world are working against him. How is it that we do the same? Warren Bennis is a um, kind of a business guru. He wrote a book years ago that caught my attention because it, it was entitled Why Leaders Can't Lead. And he talks about the, sub, the, the unconscious conspiracy, he calls it. The unconscious conspiracy is in any organization, can happen in a family, in a relationship, can certainly happen in a church. And it's where the members of the organization want to do what's best. They turn inward, focus on what's best for the organization and not for the very purpose that they exist, whether it's for the clients or in a church, to reach those who are not yet here, to turn inward and say, let's make it about us. Let's don't change. Let's don't do anything that will rock the boat here in order to reach people who are not yet here. It's unconscious because the leaders and the people in the organization don't see it. And it's a conspiracy because it's working against the very thing that they're seeking to accomplish. The unconscious conspiracy can take place in your life. You can work against God, becoming the own vil- your own villain in your story. So I am so grateful And listen, guests, you need to know this. You heard it from Corey earlier. I am so thankful to be in a church, to be pastoring a church that says, no, it's not about us. And as we are in a season of budget planning, it's about others who aren't yet here. And we've got to lead that way. We've got to say, let's give up to give. And yes, way beyond anything, 
that, that we're giving here to our church so that the gospel might be known here and around the world. We're going beyond. I hope you're praying about that. Stacy and I have prayed about that. We've talked through it and we have decided what we're going to give and we have given. And it, and it just was one of those, yes, Lord, thank you that we're able to be a part of this. And if you've not yet done so, I hope you will. So the, the tenants, their entitlement leads them to rejection. They throw God out of the vineyard, if you will. We do the same. We throw him out of the vineyard of our friendships when we don't love and encourage other people. We throw him out of our, of our, of our homes when we decide that we're going to run the show. We're going to outsource discipleship of our kids to somebody else. Uh, we, we, we throw him out at work. Again, when we don't determine that the workplace is actually my mission field, we throw him out of our finances, the vineyard of our finances. When we say, when we don't seek him in terms of, Lord, should I buy this? Should I pursue this? And how can I give? We throw him out of the vineyard of our sexuality. When we say, I'm going to do what I want to do to please myself. I'm going to watch whatever I want to watch. I'm going to watch it on Netflix. I'm going to watch porn, whatever it is. I'm going to say, instead of embracing God's better story of sex that is found in the context of a loving covenantal relationship throughout all of life, we reject Jesus when we have a sense of entitlement. And I want to ask you, how are you doing that? And how, what is the solution? We overcome it through humility first but we have to be humble before him. And then he says in verse nine, so I spent a lot of time on that first point. The next two, real quick. Verse nine, what will the owner do? He's saying, what options does he have? What other option does he have? The entitlement leads to rejection and rejection, watch this, it leads to a blindness. Look at verse 10. Have you not read this scripture? Remember, he's talking to biblical scholars, basically, all right? So have you not, you guys haven't read this? I mean, snarky is probably not a spiritual gift, but it's okay sometimes, evidently. So I like that. Um, so he says, you guys not read this? He, he does this often. The stone that the, that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. And they were seeking to arrest him, but feared the people, for they perceived that he had told the parable against them. Duh. Okay, that's, where you, that's what you do there. So they left him and went away. Now, here's what I want you to do. I want you to see that this will blow your mind. I want you to turn to um, Psalm 118. Psalm 118, because this is where he's drawing from. The word spoken by the word, Psalm 118. Turn there, and I want you to see what Jesus is doing here. This is awesome. So if you put this in context, all right, turn into... Psalm 118. Here's what happens. This psalm is about one. The psalmist is surrounded by his enemies. And he's calling out for the Lord to save him. All right. And so through Psalm 118, one through four, his love endures forever. His love endures forever kind of repeats. And then in verse five and six, out of my distress, I called upon the name of the Lord. The Lord is by my side. I will not fear what man can do to me. I will take refuge in the Lord. Verse eight and nine. He's surrounded by his enemies. These guys knew this text, okay? They knew this text. You see what's happening here. And then watch this. So verse 14, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. In verse 17 and 18, there's actually a reference to the crucifixion and the resurrection. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter through it. And then Jesus drops this bombshell. And here it is. You saw it there. Psalm 118, 22, 23. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, this cornerstone echoes a story about a cornerstone to be used for Solomon's temple. They reject it. It becomes this cornerstone of Solomon's porch. It was the one that should have been the cornerstone all along. Jesus is now saying he's the cornerstone that's being rejected. All right. I am the cornerstone and you are rejecting me. But watch this. There's a popular verse there, verse 24 of chapter 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Yes, any day is a great day to worship the Lord, but especially the day of salvation. That's what he's saying. And when God raises up the one who's being rejected, and Jesus says he's the one. And then look at verse 19 and 20. 
We'll put it on the screen. It says this. Save us, we pray. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, we pray. Give us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. Watch this. Save us. Yasha, we pray. Anna. Yasha, Anna, Yahweh. Yasha, Anna, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Where have you heard this? Palm Sunday. The people are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name. Jesus is saying, have you not read this? And by the way, were you, you were there on Sunday. When I came into Jerusalem, did you not hear what the people were yelling? Did you not hear what they were shouting? Some people get it. Hosanna, save us, Lord. He's saying, I am the long-awaited Messiah. I am the cornerstone. And these guys missed it altogether. Why did they miss it? Because their entitlement led them to a blindness and their blindness led them to stubbornness an ongoing hard hearted stubbornness. They're blind. And so the question I want to ask you as we close our time, we're going to sing a song together. They go out, they seek to arrest him, ironically, no, explicitly proving that Jesus' parable is true, fulfilling the parable. They leave to kill him another day, and it will come in just a few days. And Jesus proclaims it so clear. But how could we be as stubborn as they are? In what ways are you living an entitled life, leading you to spiritual blindness? And this spiritual blindness then leads to an unwavering stubbornness. How would you know? I mean, that's the key question. How would you know if you're stubborn? Because they're blind spots. We can't see them. Nine times out of 10 in my life, when, I, when I'm living with blindness, it's because someone else has pointed it out to me. I have people in my life to say, please, please, tell me what you see. Tell me. And to have a relationship with a loving wife who says, you know, you can call me out. I've got friends who can call me out. Do you have friends like that? That's what our connect groups are about. That's what our Bible studies are about. That's what our men's group right now, small groups are, are, I mean, serious about this. Men who want to walk with God and saying, I'm blind to the things in my life. Show me what's going on in my life. But I want to be open. I want to talk about what's happening. That's how you break through stubbornness is to be honest. Friends, we're not entitled It's by the grace of God that he's come to us. How would you know if you're as stubborn as a Pharisee? You might be a Pharisee if you have a judgmental spirit towards other people. You might be a Pharisee if if your race has caused you to think that you're superior to others. And you look down on people who don't look like you. You might be a Pharisee if you struggle with people with with other political positions and you, you say, no, no, no. You're right. I mean, I'm right. You're wrong. You might be a Pharisee if all of your theology and practice lines up with one particular political party. That's what the Pharisees did. You might be a Pharisee if you, in your relationships, you struggle to forgive, to extend love to other people. You might be a Pharisee if you sit back and kind of watch. Check this out. You might be a Pharisee if you go to lunch and you're assessing and, and, and just kind of, call, you know, I didn't like that song and I don't know about that person up there, message, nah, not so much. You might be a Pharisee. Hey, how was worship? I don't know. You tell me. Did you worship the Lord? How are you going to apply the text? How will you know if you're stubborn? I think so often in our lives, we, and, and here's what I think Jesus would say to us. I think today, we, we, you could say, well, Jeff, I'm struggling to forgive someone. I think Jesus was stepping and say, have you not read? Forgive as I have forgiven you. Yeah, but you don't know. I mean, this person in my family, I mean, it's messed up. And I cannot, I can't, I, I just cannot. My spouse, I mean, we're struggling right now. And you just don't know. Have you not read? Love your spouse as Christ loves the church, died and gave his life for her. Have you not read? 
You might say, well, I'm, man, I do, honestly, I struggle with, with racism or I struggle to love certain people that don't agree with me. Have you not read? Bless those who are enemies and those who persecute you. Have you not read? Now, if you, if you don't know God's word, you're not in it, then you don't know what you had not read anything. So we've got to be in his word. I want to challenge you to join the fellowship of the church. You've got to be in a connect group. You've got to do life with others. And then the Lord speaks to us. Friends, do not reject the Lord. And if you're here today and you've never received Christ, I want to challenge you to do so. Because here's where this goes. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, and 4, 4 through 6. As you come to him, Jesus, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Let's pray together. Friend, have you received Jesus as your Savior? We're going to have the opportunity here, friends, to declare together through song. Before we head into the week, whatever is going to come our way, we get to stand together, proclaim Jesus as the cornerstone of our lives. Jesus meets your entitlement with his overwhelming love. He meets your blindness with the clarity of his grace. He meets your stubbornness with the lens of truth. Let his kindness lead you to repentance. And friend, if you've never received Christ, don't be like the Pharisees. Don't be like those that Jesus told this parable to. He's telling it to you now. There's a time when it's going to be too late. And he's saying, now is the time. Receive his grace. He's the only way. Have you not read? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Receive him now. Lord, we desire that you be the cornerstone of our lives. That we build our lives on you. Every relationship, everything in our lives, our future, we lay it down. Jesus, we worship you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for taking time to watch this sermon. If you would like more information about our church or following Jesus, please go to our website, pcbc.org, or contact our church offices. We hope to see you next week at church.